we on? We're on. Hey guys, welcome back to Enlightened Turtle. It's your host Kev here. So in today's video, we're going to be taking a look at Hercules. Now, in previous videos, we have discussed Troy potentially being in England and being a Celtic conflict. Well, if that is to be the case, then surely some of the characters of the Iliad and the whole epic of Troy would have some kind of relation to the Celtic mythology, whether it be through language as well, uh, geography. There's landmarks. There's a lot of stuff that we could we can try and bounce the Celtic ideology off the Iliad. So today's video, like I say, we're going to be taking a look at Hercules. I haven't pre-recorded this video. Um, I haven't done a, a dry run, so I don't know how long this is going to take. But I'm going to try my best to stay on point. So without further ado, let's get straight into it. Hercules is the son of Zeus and his wife, Alcamene, a mortal woman. Zeus also goes by Jupiter, Pecunus, Perun, Indra, Dius, Zodges, fair play if you can pronounce that word, Thor, and maybe Adam, but more on King Adam in another video. Um, and I will just say briefly that I've got a couple of books here from Waddle and he does make reference to the connections between multiple versions of Zeus and I've come across other authors and historians who've taught similar uh, philosophies and there's a lot of, not a lot, but there's other people out there who've got similar ideas so this is something that I've been working on in the background a little bit and I'm hoping to do a video on that in the future because I think it'll be quite cool but back to the story Iphicles was Hercules' brother. To be honest, not many people know Hercules had a brother, which I didn't. Born one day apart, he was the son of Alcamene and their human husband, Amphitryon. Iphicles was also the father of Hercules' charioteer, Aeolus, by his first wife. Hercules killed his brother's children. Nevertheless, yet so I should have mentioned there, the reason he kills his brother's kids is because Hera, say Zeus's wife, the jealous goddess, who absolutely despises him, apparently done something, I um, can't remember what it was at the top of my head now, and it makes him go crazy, and in his deranged madness, he kills his brother's two children, um, which is quite tragic, but his brother forgives him, stands by him, and the story goes on. Iphicles went with Hercules on a punitive expedition against Troy because King Laomedon refused to give Hercules the mares or Trojan horses he had promised him before. The horses are something I do need to come back to in another video as well. Hercules was a Greek god, sorry, a Greek hero and demigod. Since he was the product of Zeus, one of Zeus's infidelities, Hercules was hated and hounded by Zeus's wife, Hera. Hera ensured that Hercules, Hercules' life was full of hardships and struggle. As discussed previously, with him clutching and squeezing two serpents and avoiding a premature death, where, remember, he, I think I shared the motif from the Bob Dylan video in that video as well, with the goddess clutching the two, two serpents. Um, and he was in his, he was in bed with Iphicles at that time as well. Um, so he actually saved his brother's life as well. We shall look in this video at some of the connections between this Hercules and some other characters of the past. So as you can see here in the photograph, this is Melkart or the Tyrrhenian the Tyrrhenian Hercules. The Phoenician Baal, but we'll discuss more of this now. 
Herodotus connected Hercules to the Phoenician god Melchard, often titled the Lord of Tyre. <coughs> Baal, sir, he was also known as the son of Baal, or El, the ruler of the universe, king of the underworld and protector of the universe. Melgard, or also spelt as Melkarth, or Melkarth, meaning king of the city. He was the Phoenician god of trade and the protector of sailors and chief deity of Tyre. Baal, sir, lord of Tyre. Baal is like a phrase, um, a bit like what Wilson and Blacker associate Labana to, as in like, or like Pharaoh, you know, that kind of title. Malkart was celebrated annually at his resurrection ritual performed during the months of February and March, known as Agesis. He was a major deity in the Phoenician and Punic pantheons. He was also known as the son of Baal or El, the ruler of the universe, king of the underworld and protector of the universe slash realm. A book shows the Semitic etymology shows where the Semitic etymology leads us that this photograph should be above that, sorry. Erg oh, oh dear. I couldn't interact with last time we've done this and now it's very interactable. Ergus or egg a cis is a noun, it's feminine and it means rousing, excitation, arising up or resurrection from the dead, which is interesting because we touch on something a bit later on. So that, that shows how etymology leads us into how Melchard connects with the biblical reference, references to Moloch. But enough on that for now. Hannibal was a faithful worshipper of Melchard. The Roman historian Levi records the story that just before setting off on his march to Italy, he made a pilgrimage to Gades or the Pillars of Hercules slash the Straits of Gibraltar, which I've been there, it's pretty cool. Another god I've seen Hercules linked to is the Egyptian god of wind and air, Shu. In Egyptian mythology, sorry, on this photograph here, this is the scene of Geb and Nut, you know, the sky goddess. And this is more primordial rather than like the 12 principal deities, if you will, of Egypt more to do with like the creation in egyptian mythology shu meaning emptiness and he who rises up married to a sister <coughs> married to a sister is a personification of air his daughter nut was the sky goddess and his son geb the earth and whose laughter was earthquakes the egyptian version of this god who helped ray or ra God of the Sun, to defeat those adversaries that had threatened the cosmic order. He protected Ra from the snake demon Ape, thus enabling the sun to travel through the underworld during the night and bringing the sun to life every morning. Which just makes you think of Apollo, you know, the way Apollo was a charioteer of the sun. Um, not Shu, obviously Ra. Shu is apparently a god of the Enenid that consisted of the 12 Egyptian deities from the Greeks, from which the Greeks are said to have fashioned their idea of the 12 Olympians. So you can see there, you know, the connections between Egypt and um, the Greeks, if you will, is quite intimate, um, especially considering you've got the correlation of the 12 gods which they're not alone in that to be fair the ostrich feather is the hieroglyph for his name Shu holds an ankh symbol of breath and life and and was a scepter represent and sorry supposed to say and has a scepter representing power due to his connection of dividing the sky and the earth geb and nut Shu seems more associated with the Titan Kronos, who separated Uranus, the sky, and Gaia, the earth, also associated with Atlas, the Titan, 
who held up the heavens, who we should come back to in a little bit, um, Titan. But I just want to go up real quick. So you've got um, Hercules protecting another god, Ra, um, uh, from a serpent. Now, that's a reoccurring theme throughout mythology, um, the serpent. Whether it's the serpent that circles the earth or, or whatever. But also, Hercules has many battles with monsters, i.e. the Hydra. And there's one sea monster, which we're going to come on to in a moment, um, which actually does battle with, linked to the horses of Troy. That's the clue. Uh, blah, blah, blah. So here we have uh, a quick image here. Now, if you look on this image, um, what, what details? This has got the Byzantine Empire. So that's Eastern Rome and Western Rome. Um, and it's just a map, really, just to, to show where we're trying to work here. But this is where a lot of the uh, Hercules ideology and stuff is, whether it be Heracles or Hercules, Greek, Roman. Most mainstream takes you to this part of the world, and there's we're going to see there's more nuance to it than that. Hercules is Roman, sorry, Hercules is the Roman equivalent of Heracles, son of Jupiter slash Zeus, as we discussed. Hercules to the Romans is quintessentially the same as he is to the Greeks, so we won't go there. So that's why I just put that image up now. Remember, it was just basically that's basic Greeks, Romans. They all kind of speak the same lingo when it comes to Hercules and the gods. There's a few variations, but it's predominantly a change with the names and then an amalgamation of gods, really. But I'm talking a bit faster here because I don't want this video to be as long as some of the last ones. Sorry, guys. So, there we go. He also went by Ogmios, this Hercules, by the way. Celtic god of Gaul slash Argos. He was portrayed wearing swarthy, which I had to Google that word means dark, or like a hue, like a dark hue. Skin and armed with a bow and a club, and we'll come back to the bow in the future. He was also a god of eloquence, meaning persuasive, and in that aspect, he was represented by drawing along a company of men whose ears were chained to his tongue, which is quite gruesome to be honest. Hercules was believed to have lived around 3,000 to 3,200 years ago. Hercules attacked Troy around 3,200 BC, and it was the father of Priam, uh, Laomedon, who reigned at this period, well, during this period. Priam was in Phrygia at this time, according to Homer, and I put potentially Scotland, which we'll see when it comes when it comes to the uh, the maps. Ancient Greece is considered to have had two well-renowned periods in history for two ages, the Age of Heroes and the Classical Age. The Age of Heroes is also like the Age of Legend, if that makes sense. Both from around 2000 BCE to 500 AD, with the change in the ages coming around 800 BCE, or 300 years after the, the Dark Age as claimed by the mainstream. Sorry, just let me go drink a coffee. <clears throat> Excuse me. With the change in the ages coming around 800 BC or 300 years after the Dark Age as claimed by the mainstream to the end of Rome as we are taught. So we, we are told that this Age of Heroes lasted 4,000 years ago and ended uh, 2,500 years ago and in that period you see a couple of hundred years before you see the rise of Rome really and all through this period as we discussed in a previous video like I said I don't want to segue too much here but we discussed the Dorians and there's more to come on that like that wasn't the end of that video that was it uh, that was just a recap of earlier content. We've got more stuff to, to bring out on that. Rome, in its pomp, conquered Greece, later becoming the Eastern Roman Empire, ruled from Constantinople, or modern-day Istanbul. The miracle of Istanbul. 
Homer believed when, when he wrote the Iliad and Odyssey that he was describing events that happened only a few hundred years before his own time. Homer is largely believed to have lived in the 8th century BCE, with the events of the Trojan War alleged, alleged by some to have taken place up to 400 years earlier. I must mention though, it is possible he was an eyewitness to the Trojan War. So yeah, uh, say there's different elements of uh, Homer's way where it, it, it seems very, I don't want to say the word intimate, but first hand, it seems almost first hand, it seems as though he was there. But we're going to do the video on Homer at a later date, so I'll digress on that for now. As I mentioned previously, Troy had also been sacked by Hercules prior to the famous siege. Another account goes, having been betrayed by King Laomedon, Hercules went to the city and killed all but one of the king's sons. Sorry, dead quick, because you're probably looking at this image on the screen. I just wanted to put that in there for, this is just a timeline. So, from 700 BC, that's the beginning of the Iron Age. This is almost like when the culture turned back on after the Dark Age, if that makes sense. Uh, and as you can see, the Bronze Age is on here to just over 2,000 years to around 700 BC. So, it's all in there. That's just a, a visual reference for the timelines. The remaining son, uh, Padrakis, this is after uh, Hercules has killed all Laomedon's sons. The remaining son, Padrakis, saved his own life by offering Hercules a gift. Padrakis was later renamed Priam, and obviously uh, King of Troy during the Trojan War. I discussed some of this in the Troy Part 1 video, but there's more on this. A few centuries after Homer's time, Herodotus attempted to provide a definitive timeline of the events of the heroic age in his histories, excuse me, linking royal genealogies, genealogies of his own time, historical events and descriptions in older texts. Herodotus settled on a date roughly of 1251 BC for the start of the Trojan War, which was obviously a 10 year conflict. This is one of the oldest dates I have come across, to be honest, and it is. Later, writers such as Apollodorus of Athens expanded on the works of Herodotus. Their chronology puts the Trojan War at about 1200 BC. The installation of Priam as king about 40 years before, and the birth of Hercules roughly 40 years prior to that. So he's saying, Apollodorus thinks um, the Trojan War was 1200, so it's around 50 years difference from Herodotus and he believes that go back 40 years till Priam was king and then 40 years prior, so that's 1280 he believes Hercules was born. And as you can see here, this is Hercules destroying a monster, but we'll come back to that in a moment. Such ancient historians believe that Hercules was born around 1280 BCE. So Hercules was born roughly 100 or 200 years before the destruction of Troy. Give or take, if we take off the premise, if we work off the premise, then the war would have been around 3200 to 3000 years ago. I've got my words muddled up there. Basically what I'm saying is, if Hercules was around in, around, uh, 3,280 years ago and the most accepted date for the Trojan War is around 31, the end, the end of the 3100s. So we know that we can start putting pieces together on um, dates now. We can start working to some kind of structure. Now as I've mentioned the chronology is all over the place and we will have to keep bringing that issue up. Um, but we can start, like I said, said in that last video, start trying to put pins down on the maps 
So such and such is supposed to be here at such and such a date. How would this correlate to this? Because I don't want to get too far, but towards the end of the video, I do mention, I'm sure I do, that um, it seems as though there was epicenters and then a gradual dispersion of information. Hence why you see almost elongated chronologies, elongated stories and divergences from source material to whatever iteration you're, you're researching. If you look, there tends to be a stretching out of that material to a source. So again, I don't want to keep segueing, so we'll keep moving. The dating is not precise enough to make any claims for me as of yet. I have a video planned in relation to our chronology, as when we go this far back, allegedly people lived longer, which is something I'm that's something I really want to get into, but I have not had the time to think this concept through. I haven't. I'll mention it briefly now. If in the scripture um, people had long lives and in mythology people lived longer in antiquity, these people being who we're going to touch on in a moment, the Twatha de Danan, the Isir, the um, the titans you know these are these are supposed to be gods right well what if they're not gods what if they're mortal but the mortal in the sense that they die but they have extra physical strength extra mental capacity extra dimension they're bigger they live longer lives if we Go back into all these roots. Imagine digging your fingers into a nice warm apple pie. Once you get your fingers right into the bottom of that apple pie, you start to see. <laughs> what have I just said there? Sorry, that's the craziest analogy ever. But once you get to the roots of these things, you start to see that there's, as I've just touched on before, there's core principles that are binding all these things together. Um, longevity, strength, intelligence, um, unifi unification, kingship, conquest. These people, kings or god kings, demigods, they are what they, you could, like I said, I don't, don't want to get too far off here. I'm worried about straying off here into a whole new topic, but if the people have lived that long in the past, could we then see um, the same character in multiple places. Could we then see the the gaps that we think are in our chronology are actually because we're assuming certain people only lived the lives to the same extent that we live today. So say we say we cap all the lives off for anyone to 120 years, from Hercules to anyone like all these other characters, perhaps. They actually did live longer. Only in the Bible, only uh, going back a few thousand years to Abraham and people like that, apparently they lived longer lives. Now, again, I'd never say that the Bible or the scripture is true, especially not 100% true anyway. But if they're telling you that people lived longer lives and then there's the different accounts away from monotheism into the polytheism, which is the multiple gods in a pantheon, if their gods lived longer lives, are we not seeing some kind of crossover here of um, the characters that are from deep antiquity in the Bible to the characters that are from the age of heroes in the other myth mythologies and the other historical laws of civilizations, not civilization, but cultures. Uh, I know I'm getting way off topic here, but I will say this one last thing. Did you know that there was three different types of Caucasian? I know, neither did I. I thought white was white. Now, we discussed um, Achilles being Caucasian briefly in one of the Troy videos. Um, there was a reference to a word that was used there. I uh, can't think off the top of my head now, but basically, we have the Caucasus Mountains um, and in that area is supposed to be where Noah landed and apparently from there the three races of the Caucasians branched out and there's actually a lot of um, 
uh, genetic evidence that backs this up. Sorry if I'm a little bit all over the place there, that wasn't planned. Uh, but let's get back to the video. It was on one of his 12 labours during his journey to an island in the Western Ocean, which I would say is Britain, that he set markers in the Straits of Gades, which was a Phoenician colony, probably older, which became known as the Pillars of Hercules. As I say before, that's the Straits of Gibraltar. Eman Wilkins has a different opinion on the Pillars of Hercules, but I think I might have touched on that in the past. According to another version of the prior, the prior legend, Hercules had killed the monster and saved Hesion. This is back to Troy now. Saved Hesion instead of just sacking the city. However, Lyomodon refused to give up the horses they had agreed as payment to vanquish the monster. As so, Hercules left Troy and then returned with a band of warriors, captured the city and killed Lyomodon and all his sons except Priam and Tithonus, who was carried off by Eos. Uh, we've discussed Tithonus in a previous video as well. I think he was in relation to the, the moon goddess. Sorry, I will just say that briefly as well. People like um, Priam, Lyamodon, Tithonus, that's three generations there of the same bloodline in Troy. And apparently the Trojan bloodline goes back to these demigod, god people. In fact, the Trojans themselves, like I say, are descended from gods. Um, so, where am I just getting up to here? Oops. Hercules gave Hesion to Telamon, who had fought at his side. Lyomodon, legendary king of Troy, son of Ilus and who. Eurydice, Eurydice. By the way, we should start playing a game here. For any name that I struggle to pronounce, I want to see you guys try and pronounce that name yourself. <laughs> struggle along with me. So you've got son of Illus and Eurydice, and father of Patrakis, later known as King Priam of Troy. I'll probably delete this. Yeah, that's because of all the made reference to that. He brought about his own destruction by not keeping to his word. Another version of Hercules in Troy goes, Hesion was the daughter of King Lyomodon of Troy. Hercules met Hesion after his years of enslavement. Well, his year, he spent one year in enslavement to Omphale, Omphale. When he set out for Troy, Hercules found Troy in a state of crisis as King Lyomodon had cheated Poseidon and Apollo by failing to pay failing to pay them for building the walls or the defences of Troy. As we discussed, there is no mention in the actual uh, originals of the Iliad of walls of Troy. There isn't. Um, for punishment, Poseidon had sent a large sea monster who would only be appeased by devouring the princess Hesion. Hercules sought to kill the monster and naturally expected a reward, such as Lyomodon's amazing horses. Hercules bravely killed the beasts by allowing himself to be swallowed by the monster, whom he then killed from the inside. But Lyomodon avoided paying Hercules too. What a cheapskate thing. So Hercules raised an army, including such great men as Telamon, father of Ajax. When his army captured the city, Hercules gave Hesion in marriage, as I say, to Telamon, and they soon gave birth to another hero, Tusir, which I think I might have touched on in the past as well. Hesion was given the opportunity to save any one of her fellow Trojan prisoners. She chose her brother, Podrakis, later known as Priam, as I've mentioned. Hercules battling at Troy, which is an image. For some reason, all these images have gone messed up. So that's the image of Tro um, Hercules battling in Troy that I came across. 
And if we scroll back up, I just want to show you this. Because we're going to come on to this in a moment. See on this map here, so obviously we've got Italy. Um, excuse me. That would be Argos. Excuse me. Etc. Um, and like I say, the, the maps are coming. I've been slowly working on them. Um, just taking a bit longer than I thought. And... I th what was the point I was going to make? Bloody hell. So yeah, apparently, we're going to come on to in a minute. Um, Hercules was king of this area. No, right. Just wait till we get there. Uh, so, yeah, wait, wait, wait. An ancient chronicler named Barossus, who was a Chaldean priest and author writing between 350 and 280 BC, whom connects, whom some connect, typo there, to the Cymri slash southwestern tribes of the Welsh Brits, which I have seen um, people make references to the Chaldeans eventually becoming the Cymri. Um, so that's why I put that in there. And claimed Hercules was a king. And he claimed Hercules was king of the areas of land known today as France, Spain and Italy for a period of 67 years. So if Hercules was king according to this uh, Chaldean, this Barossus, Barossus, if Hercules was king for what was it, sorry, 67 years, and that's a long time to be king. So you'd imagine he became king very young, unless he lived a long life. So that kind of ties back into the, the dates and things like that. But I don't want to get too involved in that, as I say. This would be the vast, this would be a vast kingdom during the late Bronze Age, would it not? And it would, like, this is supposed to be tribes. In, in Europe at this time and they were tribes but when someone like Achilles um, sorry Hercules is supposed to have been on the scene he was supposed to have the power to pull people along with his tongue get people involved get people behind him now we have already discussed the link between Hercules and the Ogham the ancient Irish language potentially being named after him. I found some interesting bits on Albania, which may lead to a video in the future, which it probably will. King Eurytheus, on another labor, set Hercules the task of fetching the golden apples of the Hesperides that had been given to Zeus as a wedding gift and were guarded by a dragon with a hundred heads, offspring of Typhon and Echidna, Echid, Echidna, 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 yeah. On this journey, he wrestled Nerus for information and Antius to pass through the country of Libya, which was northern Africa. Also, um, Phoenicians later becoming Celts themselves. My apologies for that, I just had to go and take care of something. So where was it there? On his travels, he found Prometheus and destroyed the eagle that was eating his liver. Prometheus told Hercules not to go after the apples himself, but to send Atlas instead. When Hercules reached the land of the Hyperboreans, where Atlas held the heavens, Hercules volunteered to hold the heavens while Atlas got the apples. Atlas did so, but didn't want to resume the burden, so he said he'd carry the apples to Eurytheus. Using some cunning, Hercules agreed, but asked Atlas to take back the heavens for a moment so he could rest a pad on his head. Atlas allowed this, and Hercules slipped away with the apples. When he gave them to the king, to Eurytheus, the king, he then returned them and Hercules gave them to Athena to return them to the Hesperides. So I don't know why he bothered taking them in the first place. Which was Hercules' 11th labour. Now, the reason why I mentioned that the apples there is because, get on this, you're not going to believe this. 
This labor or quest was as just stated to take the apples from the Hesperides. The Greek pronunciation Hesperides, Hesperides are the nymphs of evening and golden light of sunset who were living daughters of the evening or nymphs of the west. So I was like, there's a lot of references to the west here. So I've done a little digging. The Hesperides lived in a faraway garden on the outer edge of the known world, in which grew trees which bore golden apples. As we have discussed, the potential of Britain being the area to which Hercules stole Hesiod, given its locality to East Anglia, and to the lands under the domain of Hercules and other parallels. So what I'm saying there is, if Hercules owned Greece, sorry, um, Italy, Spain and France, then why wouldn't he go into Britain, to Troy? Why would he be king of all these lands and, constant, and sail all the way across the Aegean, all the way along the Mediterranean, all the way up the Aegean, into the Darnells, to Hisala? That makes absolutely no sense. That is one epic voyage when, as you can see here, the locality of Britain and this I've called them the Atlanteans as a joke in the past, but the Atlantic Celts, this Atlantic region, he seems to have a lot of influence and the locality would make a lot more sense. But again, we'll understand that further on the maps. Um, where was he up to then? As we have discussed, blah, blah, blah. So the name Hesperides sounded etymologically similar to Hebrides of Scotland. And after a snoop on Google, I found a lone apple tree on an uninhibited, uninhabited Hebridean island, which apparently could date back a whopping 11,000 years. Now, I don't believe that any humanity went back 11,000 years. At this moment in time, I just, I can't perceive it. Never mind, believe it. But look at that, I was looking into the Hesperides so I thought, well, if they lived on an island, check some of the islands around Britain, you know. And then the one that popped out was obviously the Hebrides. Obviously, you've got the inner, inner Hebrides and the outer Hebrides, which is a chain of islands. And lo and behold, there was a lone apple tree that had golden brown apples on it. I mean, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. The crab apple tree on Pabe Pab Moor was found growing in 2003. The apple has a goldenish brown complexion, yet its presence has proved a mystery as there are no known native apple trees on the nearest islands of Lewis, Harris and North Uist. So it's a standalone apple tree just in the middle of the Hebrides or the, what was it called? The Hesperides. So similar phonetically that who knows. So where were we? There's a photograph of Hercules there with the bow. And like I say, this is all moved around unfortunately on me here. The bow of Hercules is a weapon similar to Ogmios. That myth tells us was passed to Phil Tetis, Philoctetes, Philoctetes, following Hercules' death. I have come across that name before, as you'll see now, and to be honest, I wish I could just fire these out. Following Hercules' death, as he was the only person willing to light the funeral pyre. So when Hercules died, he lit the pyre and got Hercules' bow. The bow became vital to the Greek army at Troy. Philoctetes, Philoctetes, yeah, that sounds a bit better. A Greek hero had rejoined the war after being left on the island of Lemnos and shot one of Hercules' arrows at Paris, which allegedly, according to that story, is how Paris died. We have researched thus far the Trojan connection between this older period of pre Greece, or the Dorian and Phoenician links. Some say this period, and we have got more to come on the Dorians, as I say. 
Some say this period was the age of heroes. I would, I would say, that's a typo, I would say it was the end. In Egypt, this period is known as Zeptepe, and or another race is called the Twatha di Danon of Ireland. Or, the, uh, <clears throat> or, uh, uh, or another example, who were called the Shining Ones, an ancient pre-Celtic Irish tribe is one we shall visit later, which could possibly be purely mythological, mythological, but I will do a video on them as I believe they have a role to play in the developing tapestry of my Bayoun tapestry. <laughs> so I'm sorry, so we're gonna drink there. Seems like once you get past the half an hour mark, the throat gets really dry. Um, so yeah, just to touch on what I'm saying here, the Twatha di Danon is that's a group of I'm not gonna lie, they sound like elves. If you go and watch Lord of the Rings, they basically sound like elves. But like I say, we've got a video to do on them in the future. There are many connections of which I find striking, such as the mention of an island out in the west in the Atlantic. For me, is surely Britain. Britain also potentially, I've done another typo there, Britain could also be potentially be the location of the Hyperborea, terrible typing, perhaps Ireland or Greenland. The Hyperboreans in the mainstream are mythical people, intimately connected with the worship of Apollo, god of archery, music, poetry, the sun and light, and of Artemis goddess of the wind and wild hunt, vegetation of chastity and childbirth, and Artemis is Apollo's twin. These Hyperboreans are said to have come from the, from beyond the north wind, and that's from multiple sources. I have got a, uh, an audio book regarding Hyperboreans on the channel somewhere. Long after the Romans conquered the Gauls, the Roman satirist Lucian wrote a satirical, satirical story about Celtic beliefs. It describes Lucian and a Celtic man looking at a painting of Ogmios. Lucian's description of the painting is the main source of visuals, of visual representations of Ogmios. The Celtic Ogmios Hercules, potentially. Ogmios appears to be an older version of Hercules since both Ogmios and Hercules wear lion skins and carry a bow and club. I should say though, this Ogmios is supposed to be further back, but I, no one knows of these timelines, I'm telling you. This, however, could be the transference of knowledge or another indicator of a gap in our chronology. According to Wikipedia, Lucian is shocked to see that the bound men following Ogmios do not think of escaping. In fact, they follow cheerfully and joyously, applauding their leader and all pressing him close and keeping the keeping the leashes slack in their desire to overtake him. Apparently, they would be offended if they were let loose. In the story of a Celtic man, in the story a Celtic man explains that the painting shows the Celts believe Ogmios is similar to Hercules. The Greek hero who defeated many adversaries with his strength. Hercules has the power of strength and Ogmios has the power of eloquence. The Celts believe that eloquence is the ultimate power because it can enthrall men and control them more so than strength can. So the point there being is Hercules is supposed to have an empire, a kingdom. But let's be honest, if you own France, Spain and Italy, you, you've got an empire. Um, now, if you're a king there, you're not just a king, are you? You're going to be a high king. But that's stuff we'll come on to in the next video regarding this stuff. So as you can see in this image here, this is Ogma and... This Irish deity is closely related to Ogmios, is Ogma. 
or OGNA Ogma, a warrior of the Tuatha Dé Danann, who is also credited with inv inventing the Ogma alphabet, also associated with Hercules. Both Ogmios and Ogma are known as smiling deities of eloquence. Ogma is attested from the Old and Middle Irish literature, which dates to significantly a significantly later period, period and other type of apologies than the material for Ogmios. The chains made out of amber and gold represent Ogmios using his powers of persuasion and eloquence to bind his listeners to his every word. From the description, it appears that Ogmios, Ogmios's followers, willingly follow him with cheerful faces and try to get as close to Ogmios, Ogmios as they can. This shows that he has the power to change and the influence. The power to change and influence men's minds so that they want to follow him to the ends of the earth. And that kind of, like I say, if he's got a giant kingdom, then he's going to attract some pretty loyal people, isn't he? So etymologically, Heracles, 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 Greek, I don't know how to pronounce that means lit glory slash fame of Hera, which is interesting I found. French specialists give two different explanations for the Gaulish name. Philip Duet proposed the, to connect Ogma to the Indo-European root word for Hek Sha, Hek which means sharp, stone or vault, and the Greek Akmon which means meteorite. Now this is fascinating to me this. Because the recent video on the channel regarding King Og in the Bible to whom he had a stone sarcophagus alleged to be made from iron ore, was this a stone vault? Iron found in raw form fused with rock, which was also alleged to have been gathered from the ground, mined and meteor meteorite fragments during the Bronze Age. <coughs> Excuse me. According to Xavier Delamar, Ogmios, the root word, would be path, guide, or confirming in this role as a sickle chopum, sickle chumum, <laughs> psycho chumum. Try and pronounce that word right there. Psycho pump, psycho pump. A spirit deity, or person, some form of association with necromancy. Sycopomps from the Greek word, can't pronounce that. Psychopo, psychompos, literally meaning the guide of the souls, or creatures, spirits, angels, or demons, or destine, don't know what that means, destin, deitessin, never heard that word, deitessin. Many religions whose responsibility is to escort newly deceased souls from earth to the afterlife which has given me Egyptian God King Osiris vibes which yeah like I say I'm going to touch on this now we find um, what the hell is that we find rotated to Hercules Seagon <laughs> I don't know what's happening there I think I was Sometimes I type so fast and because it's on my phone, uh, it just does autocorrect or just, it sometimes it just does random things. But what I, th I think I'm meant to type there is we find associated to Hercules of the Aegean um, or something like that, but let's just take that out. This god is probably a form of the Gaelic Segamo, whose name means victor or mighty one. As with Smerterus, Segamo was associated, also associated with Mars and Sequini, worshipped as Mars Segamo. A bronze horse with the legend Segamo was found in Burgundy, part of the territory, so this is North Europe, like North Germany kind of stuff. And the statue of the mule dedicated to him comes from Nui and Sullias in west central France. So this would be west 
France. So this would be, uh, if you were to look at the Trojan War period, this would be the area that Agamemnon controls. Unlike Borvo, however, there is no contradiction between Hercules and Mars, both fighting gods. And as, as Marian Green points out, Segamo is really more of a title than a name, similar to the term Baal, so we've seen a reoccurrence of that as well. In Ireland, the name Nia Segamoin, or Servant of Segamo, suggests his cult may have reached all the way from central France to the Hibernian Celts. So, again, connections between all his Celtic peoples. Like, they go all, they, these people are Gauls and these people are Celts, but uh, that's, that's already a fracturing. They, they, they're the same peoples, they come from the same root. The language, the, the mythology, it's all there. Sorry, a bit of a squeaky chair. Another Celtic motif is that after he killed Gerion, Hercules founded a city on the spot of their battle and buried Gerion's head under it. The head of the Welsh wise man and warrior Bran is supposedly buried under the Tower of London. So you're getting more connections and different stories, more intertwining of multiple beliefs. This god, like Smertrios, had a wide following. Eleven dedications to him come from North East Gaul, one from Mormrills in Scotland, and two temples at Elst and Empel in the Netherlands. A statue from the letter from the latter shows the god with the beard and lion skin of Hercules holding up one hand that may want to grasp the club. Oh, I haven't put down photographs in. My apologies. <clears throat> Excuse me. There may be a part two to Hercules, as there is more to discuss from bulls in Spain, and bulls in general really, and to his links to Asia Minor slash Mesopotamia. Now we're talking in Gilgamesh and all this kind of stuff that we still got to discuss yet. After putting this video together, it shows the mythology to be far more expressive, expansive and dynamic in the West than I had previously thought. Perhaps Hercules was real, and his legendary status grew. So did his sorry, and as his legendary status grew, so did his mythology. So if he was a real individual, as he grew in stature, maybe tales were told of him in far off lands that, you know, became part of the the perception and eventually became into reality. People started, you know, worshipping and all this kind of stuff. I don't know, but we're going to get to the bottom of it. It appears as though these different characters cannot be the same. I followed the links and some are remarkably similar. However, it seems that the god slash deity, demigod slash deity, morphs slash changes over time and geography. I shall end this video here as there are further connections up to 3000 years ago and even further back into our ancient past still to be discussed. Yeah so we still got quite a bit to talk about really. If anyone's watching this let me know in the comment section just, just mind the long format or do you prefer smaller videos because in these longer videos I do get to elaborate a little bit more on certain elements. But I understand the time pressure and um, some people can't sit there for two hours and watch a video. So I try to keep them at least underneath under an hour. But even that's proven a little bit difficult at the minute. So if people would prefer it, I could split this into part one, part two, part three even. Um, like this one video. Obviously there's multiple parts anyway. Um, but I digress on that anyway. I am looking forward to digging deeper into the Twatha di Danan and the Ise, of which is already in the works, along with other deeper dives. So like I say, uh, it takes me a little bit of time to compile these videos and get them done. So I am trying to do smaller video content just to keep keep some content rolling really. Um, and I'm trying to keep it on point, like that last video relating to the um, Sarmeticus and 
um, the Egyptians and the Phrygians. That, according to Herodotus in this book, it proves, essentially, according to him, that the Phrygians are older than the Egyptians. I've already discussed um, certain elements of what I think about Egypt in other videos, and that'll be another topic for another video, another day. Like I say, you ask one question, you spend a bit of time, you get the answer, and then you come up with three or four more questions. Excuse me, so it's a beautiful, long, never-ending story. So stay safe, guys. Stay tuned. Hit the like button and all that stuff. And hopefully I'll catch you in the next video. Peace.